Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for today's WESIS webinar with Target. We have Katie and Susan with us today who are going to be leading our presentation. Uh, before we get started, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to WESIS for those of you who are not familiar with us. Give me one second. That is not my slides. So oh, hold on. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So um, WESIS is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a global reach dedicated to bringing together women in cyber cybersecurity with a mission to recruit, retain, and advance women in cyber. We have over 9,800 members, 60 professional affiliate, I'm sorry, 70 professional affiliates now, over 260 student chapters, and we're in 95 countries. Uh, we offer a variety of different initiatives to all of our members, um, some of those being our virtual and in-person career fair, we have our webinar series that we're hosting today, we have our Job Board Plus Plus, uh, our Mentor Mentee program, our amazing Target Cyber Defense Challenge program, if you haven't applied, it is open, I, I believe applications are still open, but that one's coming up, so thank you Target team for that one, um, and many more opportunities for our members to join throughout the year. Um, I want to just take a moment to uh, thank our strategic partners. Uh, they make everything possible for us in all of these opportunities and skills development training programs. Uh, for our members, our tier one partners are Akamai, Amazon, AT&T Cybersecurity, Bloomberg, Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute, Cisco, Ford, Google, Lockheed Martin, Microsoft, Optum, Cyndia National Labs, and Centennial One. Just a reminder, um, to ask questions today, please, during the webinar, you have um, a little chat feature available where you can drop your questions in. Uh, we will get to the questions at the end. So um, you can ask them as they come up and we'll just spend about the last 10, 15 minutes answering those questions today. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the WESIS newsletter to stay up to date on all of our upcoming programs and initiatives. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the Target team to introduce themselves and get us started today. All right. Thank you, Morgan. Hello. I am Katie Wolfram, the Senior Engineering Manager for the Product Security Team at Target. I've been in this space for eight years now, so really excited about today's topic. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan Whitting. I'm a Lead Engineer on the Product Security Team at Target. I've worked with Katie here for over six years, and I've also helped build and roll out many of the tools that our team owns as well. Now, I hope many of you on the call are Carly Rae Jepsen fans, but more so, I hope you're ready to learn about open source vulnerabilities um, and uh, enjoy this talk as well. Now, this title here, inspired by our iconic Carly Rae Jepsen's hit song, Call Me Maybe, truly captures what we are experiencing in the open source security world today. Hey, I just scanned you and this is crazy, but here are your bones. So fix them maybe <laughs> from a developer perspective perspective. I'm thinking, okay, where did all of these bones come from? Why are there so many of them? How do I prioritize them? And what about all my other business priorities? And then from a leader perspective, or even just program perspective, teams today have to fix so many vulnerabilities. They have a huge pile of endpoint bones, pen test findings, uh, compliance findings. And now on top of that, we're going to add a whole lot of open source vulnerabilities. So we'll cover how we at Target have gone from having teams fix things maybe to having teams fix things mostly. Susan, if you were Carly and you were writing this song about what we do every day, what would be the wish that you would throw in the well? Well, I wish that I didn't have to spend so much time managing so many vulnerabilities. And I wish that our engineers would fix their vulnerabilities quickly and consistently all the time. However, to make either of these wishes reality, you have to take intentional planning in order to implement changing behavior and helping our engineers make sure that what they're doing every day is secure. 
So we'll cover our journey over the last five years, as well as the lessons that we learned, feedback that we heard from our engineering teams, and then touch on what we're really looking forward to with our broader objectives in the next rest of this year, as well as next couple of years. To get us started, I'll cover what software composition analysis or what we'll refer to as SCA is for the rest of the talk and why it matters. Carly actually wrote the original lyrics for her song, but that's not always true for all musicians. Sometimes they have ghostwriters, sometimes they take previously created songs to make a new song. It's the same thing for applications. You could build an application that's completely standalone source code, but it's normally much faster and easier to take what others have already created to build your applications. Those are those open source components or open source libraries. An average application is generally made up of 80 to 90% of those open source components. This is where SCA can be really helpful. It will scan your source code and tell you an inventory of all of your open source components, as well as the known vulnerabilities reported against those open source components. However, the way that teams manage or maintain their applications for these pieces can be pretty complicated. For example, say you're building an application, you're pulling in an open source library. That open source library could be pulling in another open source library. And then that open source library could be pulling in another open source library. And suddenly you have this huge tree of all these dependencies that you don't know or may not actually use within your system, how do you actually maintain them and make sure that they're as secure as possible? Now, normally engineers can just remediate their SEA vulnerabilities by simply upgrading to the latest version of their dependency. But you can also pin to a specific version to remediate. You can also remove an unused library um, to remediate an SEA vulnerability. There are many ways to do this. And depending on which package manager you're using, this could also look different across your projects. And all of this adds layers of complexity, which makes the problem a lot more complicated. And that is why we are so proud to see any sort of progress in this space. So let's take a look. Now we're expecting our engineers to do a ton of remediation work on their never ending pile of vulnerabilities and it is overwhelming. But you might have experienced this type of work before and if you own a home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I own a home myself and my husband and I decided to build a second bathroom in our house. Uh, we started it in last September and you guessed it, we're still not done. <laughs> And that's because as a part of that project, we needed to redo our floors. We needed to redo our electrical. We needed to rearrange our washer and dryer and boiler in our basement because we were adding another radiator. Each new project uncovered another project that needed to be done in order for us to move forward and make progress. And it feels overwhelming and it feels never ending. That is how it feels like to remediate SCA vulnerabilities, which is why we are so proud to see the progress that you see here on the screen. Over the past two and a half years, we have worked really hard at Target to reduce our open source vulnerabilities on internet facing systems by 76%. That is huge. Now we've only been able to see this type of change because we are influencing with accountability and we're partnering and we're supporting and guiding our teams through this entire experience. So let's back up and rewind and talk about how we got to where we are, as well as the lessons learned along the way. Let's talk about the journey, um, the building blocks that make up our journey to help us improve our open source security strategy. Now, if you remember from earlier, uh, our wishes were to not have to spend so much time remediating and managing so many vulnerabilities, as well as having our engineers consistently remediating their vulnerabilities. Well, each block you see here on the screen corresponds to a huge initiative that we uh, that we did to help um, unblock ourselves from things that were in our way to make those wishes a reality. As Carly says in her lyrics, we weren't looking for any of this, but now they're all in our way and we've got to address it. Starting with the first blocker being Log4j, this really wasn't the beginning of our open source security strategy, but it really did help us stimulate, stimulate us to move as fast as we did to get to where we are today. 
And then for our second block, we'll cover how we took away a manual component of onboarding to SCA scanning and automated it. And now that we onboarded everyone to SCA, we needed to make sure that teams were actually remediating their vulnerabilities, which is why we added it to our 2023 Pi score or product intelligence score, which is our internal health scoring application to help drive accountability for security actions. You'll learn a, little, a lot more about what product intelligence is in a little bit here. And then just over a year after the Log4j incident, we realized that we wanted to make sure that no one would accidentally deploy the known vulnerable version of Log4j in our environment. So we implemented a guardrail to break builds in this space. So we'll cover what we did for that. And then a year of SEA vulnerabilities being in the Pi score, uh, we discovered that we needed to change our algorithm as well as add in a new component that we, we found we needed along the way into our 2024 Pi score as well. And then for the last block, it pretty much brings us to what we're currently working on, which is there's still too many things to fix. So we'll cover how we're starting to lean into automation for managing and merging updates to our auto to our open source dependencies and libraries within our environment. As Susan and I go through this journey, a couple of things that I want to highlight that you'll really hear from us are the fact that we are seeking out feedback from our engineering org. We uncovered things along the way because we heard from engineers that things weren't as easy as they could have been, or there was some confusion. And so we made a lot of the progress that we were able to because of the fact that we listened, heard, and pivoted, and then implemented new things. So now that we are starting on our journey, I'll quickly go over the first block. If you didn't have the joy of remediating log4j when this incident came out, essentially it is a log4j is a very common logging library used in Java applications around the world. There was a critical severity vulnerability that allowed remote code execution where you could gain access to credentials, extract data, infect applications with malicious code all of these things that you don't want to happen to your system. But what made this unusual was that it had widespread media attention. So not only were our security teams paying attention to what was happening, but our engineering teams were following what was being talked about in the news. They knew exactly what was happening the same time we did, which is not something that you can say about all the other vulnerabilities that surround our applications today. This put our team in a unique position where we were able to move forward with some of our blocks that we talked about in the previous slide because our engineers knew about the value of open source security because of the widespread attention here. A couple of things that I want to highlight. The first one is we really utilized our security ninjas to help drive work here. You'll see us reference them in the rest of the talk, but this is our distributed security advocate program where these security ninjas sit on our product teams, they do additional security training, and they're responsible for helping us in security understand the potential security risk of items in the applications that they work in day to day. They also help upskill their teams, but they're a great component of how we learn about what's working within our application security program and what's not working. We also wished that prior to this incident, we would have had a full inventory of all of our open source components used at Target that didn't require us to manually go and grab information. It was just available. So this brings us to our next block. If anyone manages any processes that are manual, you know that it's really difficult to get to 100% completion. We had a wish in security that our engineers would take two minutes, click a couple buttons in GitHub, onboard their repos to the SCA scanning tool. That's it, done, easy. But our engineers wish that they didn't have to do it at all. So obviously these wishes are in direct conflict. We realized that we needed to remove the manual component and just automate it. It sounds simple when we're talking about it, like, yeah, just automate it, it'll be easy. But it wasn't. It required engineering effort from our team. It was a process that, one, our team hadn't done before, so we didn't have something that we could copy. And two, it hadn't been done across target, and so we had to build this from scratch. 
We also had two key considerations that we wanted to keep in mind while we were rolling this out. The first one was that we didn't want to impact performance. If we're going in and touching items in GitHub where thousands of our engineers are working throughout the whole day, if we implement something and accidentally cause breaking or blocking changes, that would be really impactful. The second aspect is thinking about how we're doing work in GitHub on behalf of our engineers in the balance of that line between getting things done and doing something on behalf of another role within our environment. Oh, it really does help that our team is actually mostly made up of developers because we're really able to bring the developer perspective to discussions as we talk through some of these huge initiatives like auto onboarding SEA to all repos across Target. And I can say from being a developer that uh, we don't like it when other people touch our repos without our permission, especially if it has the potential to block us from pushing up our code. We can be quite possessive of our code and we are very well much aware of this trait, which is why our team made sure to have back out plans, workarounds in place to make sure that the process goes as smoothly as possible and that we're not blocking anybody from pushing up their work. And in the end, it really did go really smoothly. And our developers actually felt so much better knowing that they were already automatically covered by our SEA scanning tool without having to do any work themselves, as well as uh, it really put them in a better position to protect target. Now, despite being so thoughtful about this process, there was one thing that we didn't anticipate. And that was the discovery that almost every developer owned tons of stale and not actively deployed repos, causing a huge bloating in our inventory. Now, uh, I'm not a hoarder, <laughs> but the same way that we keep a million tabs open because that one article might be useful one day, well, we also keep our POC projects and our hackathon projects from years ago, five, 10 years ago, because it might be useful one day. You never know. Um, except that in this case, from, from the product security, again, I, I mentioned it helps that we're a team of developers because we really do know these repos are likely never getting touched again, which is why we quickly partnered with our GitHub team at Target to spin up a process that will automatically archive and delete these stale and unused repos, which greatly reduced our footprint of security coverage as well as infrastructure support that was needed for them. And as a part of that cleanup effort, we needed to make sure that we were reflecting that inventory in our SEA inventory because um, we're, you, we're looking at this data in case security incidents come through. And it's important that we're looking at the most accurate and up-to-date information and not having to look through all of that bloating of the inventory that was there before. So now that we've automatically onboarded everyone, we've got an inventory of all of our open source components at Target. We also know how many vulnerabilities that we have to fix against those open source components. And there's a lot. Um, so next I'll talk about how we influence our teams at Target with our security product intelligence program or our Pi score. This is a tool that we've been using for the past seven years. It's similar to a credit score. You can see on the screen here that this team has a score of 767. The score ranges from 300 to 850, with 850 being the top of that range. We also have an objective that we want our tech teams to be above a certain score for the year. In this example, that goal is 750, so this team's above that and they're green. The idea here is that we want teams to be able to come into this, see how their score is for the health of the applications that they're responsible for managing and maintaining, and then see a quick list that's clear and actionable of the items that they can go do to improve their score. So this example, you see the to-do list of where a team can go and earn points back. We also display all the underlying data for them in this view. We just don't show that because that would have been too much on this slide. 
But essentially what we're doing is our team manages the backend algorithm. We're working with 550 points where we can weight the different categories of the score. So we can help identify what we in security consider to be most important for teams to focus on. And they don't have to think about that. They come into the score, they can make informed trade-off decisions between security actions and their regular business deliverables that they need to accomplish alongside of this. Essentially, we're trying to make security clear, actionable, and as easy as possible. So I'll cover how we introduced SCA or open source vulnerabilities in our score algorithm when we added them in 2023. You can see the high level breakdown of our score here. So these open source vulnerabilities are in the top section of findings and vulnerabilities, and they're weighted at 5% makeup of the score. We always implement new data at 5% for a couple of reasons. One, it's possible that it's the first time our whole enterprise has seen all of this data in one place consolidated. In those cases, they likely don't have processes in place for how to manage things. They might not be doing a good job of that. And so because of that, if it's weighted and capped at 5%, teams can still be above the OKR objective as long as they're maintaining the other components of their score decently well. This is something we saw with SCA vulnerabilities. Teams across the board hadn't seen everything consolidated before. So having it as a 5% buffer allowed teams to get used to and implement new processes along the way. On the flip side, it also gives rooms for the teams that are providing this data to the score. In this case, it was our own team, but Generally, when new things are added, we see source teams get flooded with support questions that come in in how we help our engineers accomplish items. We see things like bugs get noticed, data integrity issues of how we're providing information to teams, along with features and functionalities like self-scanning that the source teams didn't realize there was a need for because no one was looking at that information. So this gives teams that are providing the information a whole year as well as our engineering teams to help implement and make things easier, better to manage across the board. Now Susan will talk about how we actually implemented open source vulnerabilities in the score. All right, thank you so much. Um, now that you're familiar with what the Pi score is, we can talk about how we used it to influence teams to actually remediate their SCA vulnerabilities. Now, at this point in time that we're evaluating what will go into the 2023 Pi score, it is actually November of 2022, which is a few months before um, we roll out the score itself. <clears throat> um, November of 2022, that's almost a year after Log4j had occurred. And there's a lot of months in between there where teams were onboarded to the SEA scanning tool and seeing a bunch of results get reported. But not doing, not making much progress on the actual remediation of that, those results. Um, and this is, this is understandable because first of all, the, the, the information is very overwhelming. There's a ton of vulnerabilities that teams are going to have to start managing now, but really it's what Carly says in her lyrics here, all the other businesses try, all the other business priorities try to chase me. How do teams know where to prioritize SEA remediation alongside their business priorities and alongside all of their other security action items? This is why we decided to add SEA remediation into the 2023 Pi score to help drive um, that accountability for that work, as well as helping teams prioritize. Now, of course, we didn't just throw all of the vulnerabilities into the Pi score and hope that teams figure it out. We've, we were very thoughtful about it. And since we had months of data to work with, uh, we knew that there were a lot to work with. And so we made sure to really focus on high and critical severity vulnerabilities, as well as giving team a defined SLA to help teams uh, have, have a timeline to work with. We also provided lots of guidance, documentation, as well as uh, video tutorials on what SEA was, as well as the importance of it. You know, because if teams were, uh, you know, focused on their other business priorities, they may not have been paying attention. And like Katie mentioned, this may be the first time that they're really seeing this data come through. And so making sure that the proper education was in place for teams to 
understand what it was, the importance of, of remediating SCA vulnerabilities, as well as how to do it. I mentioned before, there's a lot of different ways to remediate SCA vulnerabilities, and this looks different across package managers, which caused a lot of confusion. So making sure that we had the proper guidance and support for that was crucial for the success of SCA vulnerabilities in the PI score. All right, now that we've got teams starting to fix things, it's been a year and a few months since the Log4j incident I talked about. We realized that we didn't want to be in a place where teams would accidentally redeploy vulnerable versions of Log4j in our environment because it was potentially easy to miss. It's, again, very commonly used. So we wanted to implement a guardrail that would break builds of applications that tried to do this with the vulnerable version. Historically, our team has avoided breaking or blocking builds, and so we wanted to be really thoughtful of how we did this, including things like letting potential teams know that they could be impacted by this well in advance. We had our team process set up so if business incidents were created, we could get be pulled into those to help manage and support teams fixing things. We implemented a whole exemption process because that was something that we saw during the Log4j incident that got asked about by teams. If you had told me that at the end of rolling this out, we caused zero business incidents and no one requested an exemption, I honestly would not have believed you. Our lesson here was really we could have moved much faster in implementing these guardrails than what we were initially comfortable with. We also uncovered during this process that teams, with how they were pulling their open source dependencies into their applications, they weren't necessarily following the preferred secure pattern. And so that brings us to changes that we implemented for our 2024 security PI score, this year's PI score. Like I mentioned about the location, this is important when you're building an application, you're pulling in your open source dependencies. If you're pulling them from an external registry like NPM or Maven Central, these locations are seeing increasing attacks from threat actors. It's relatively easy to get access and cause things like dependency confusion or infect common packages with malicious code. And so the ideal pattern is teams are pulling their dependencies from an internal registry like Artifactory, for example, where we can add additional security layers of protection against those threats that are happening to the public or external registries. This made it a really good fit for the PySore because we were able to gather that metadata and then tell if teams were doing the insecure pattern, have them fix it, and then they get the points back. And for the second bullet here for the SCA exemption process, this actually came out of the 2023 PI score. One of the things that we uncovered along the way we needed. Um, when, when security handed teams with, here are your vulns, so fix them maybe. Um, engineers do really want to fix the vulns. They want to do the right secure thing. But for some of these vulnerabilities, we realized um, that we're not actually using the vulnerable part of a library. So maybe we shouldn't be held accountable to remediate those vulnerabilities because they're not exploitable. So from a pr product security perspective, we listened, we heard, and uh, we decided that for vulnerabilities that were widespread, but that weren't exploitable, like teams were mostly based on our analysis, not using it in an exploitable, in, in, in a vulnerable way, they're not using the library in a vulnerable way, that we would ex exempt that from the 2024 PI score to help reduce the number of vulnerabilities that team really had to look at and reduce that noise for them to help them really focus on the more important vulnerabilities, which are the ones that are going to be exploitable. For the last point here, we needed to make some changes to our the way that we scored SCA vulnerabilities. Um, the way that we were doing it in 2023 was actually causing teams to lose points, even though they were consistently remediating their vulnerability. And I'll show you exactly what this looked like in the next slide here. But uh, we wanted to make sure that we were rewarding teams for the right behavior. So we went ahead and we made that change. Now, these bullets here, they're really an example of 
the beauty of the Pi Score. We're able to really seek and share user feedback with our engineers. We're conducting user interviews. We're following up with folks who've complained in our support channels and, and listening to what works, what doesn't work, and implementing what makes the most sense. What we put in the Pi Score is not set in stone. We listen to what works and we actually make sure that it makes sense for engineers to help really um, ensure that they want to continue to do the right secure thing because it actually makes sense. Yeah. Go to the next slide here. Yeah, I'm trying to click it. Hold on. Susan, are you potentially able to? Let me try. Aha. Now this here illustrates the SCA Pi score algorithm change I was just talking about in the previous slide here. As you can see in 2023, we were scoring teams on percentage of vulnerabilities not overdue. This is to incentivize teams to really uh, focus on remediating their overdue vulnerabilities first. Don't let your vulnerabilities go overdue and really work towards zero overdue vulnerabilities. Because ideally, if they had zero overdue vulnerabilities, based on this equation you see on the screen here, it should give them 100% of the points. It should give them the best possible score in this category. The problem was that for some teams, they were unable to remediate some of their overdue vulnerabilities um, just yet, maybe because it was tied to a legacy application, or maybe it was tied to an application where the scope was too large. Well, because they had overdue vulnerabilities, even though they were continually, consistently remediating their open vulnerabilities, the way that the math would work out here is that um, their score would go down, even if they just had one overdue vulnerabilities consistently remediating their open vulns would cause their score to go down, which really discouraged teams from wanting to continue to uh, remediate their open vulnerabilities because they would lose points. And that is not the behavior that we want to drive, which is why in 2024, we made a change to the algorithm to score teams on percentage of vulnerabilities remediated in the past six months to incentivize teams to consistently remediate their vulnerabilities. And with this score change, we saw that most teams' SCA Pi score actually increased, which meant that we were actually uh, that teams are actually starting to consistently remediate their bones. And this is the behavior we want to drive. And this is the behavior we want to reward. Now, with that algorithm change, as well as a whole year of SEA vulnerabilities being in the Pi score, we felt that it was safe to increase the percentage allocation here from 5% up to 10%, you can see here in the red. And as Katie mentioned before, we are very intentional about uh, this percentage allocation, because this is how we drive teams and influence teams to care about the most crucial security action items and take care of the most crucial security action items. Um, and in this case, we want teams to continue to remediate their SCA vulnerabilities, which is why we increase that impact from 5 to 10%. We also introduced 5% of the score to scoring teams on whether they're pulling their dependencies from internal or external registries to really drive teams to really pull from internal registries. And again, as Katie mentioned, since it's a new category, we're starting at 5% with the ability to, of course, increase or decrease based on how this year goes. Now, uh, since Log4J in 2021, you can see we now have 15% of our high score allocated to help improve open source security, whereas before it was at zero. So in order to actually get the data prepped to include in the Pi score for telling where teams were pulling their open source dependencies from, we needed to create the tool to pull this data. So prior to last summer, we didn't have this information. We were able to augment a tool that was able to scan our GitHub repos, tell us the open source components, and then also include the location of where those open source dependencies are being pulled from, either external or internal. As we implemented in that in this score, we learned a couple things along the way. The first one was that there are valid business reasons that teams should keep their things pointed to an external location. However, it's a pretty small amount of teams that need to do that for their cases. And so we created a minimal process where a team would have to come in, request an exemption, and we're able to track that on our end, exempt the team they're no longer negatively impacted by the Pi score for their applications that 
have this process followed. We also learned that as teams were seeing all of this reported in the PI score again for the first time, a lot of teams didn't realize they had set this incorrectly, including our team. We had a bunch of GitHub repos that we were accidentally pointing externally and didn't realize that we were setting it wrong. Um, so as we fix that, as we're supporting our engineers fixing things, we also learned that there are some cases that you ha have to do it pretty specifically in order for it to fully work. So we created a detailed self-help guide that our engineering teams would be able to follow for our common plugins and languages across Target, so they wouldn't have to ask us for support help along the way. We also had one of our security ninjas create a Dockerized container that would scan your whole local environment and tell you where all of your dependencies are being pulled from. We we're able to grab that, augment it, roll it out to the rest of our org. As we found our engineers preferred to fix everything locally, make sure that things were set up as expected, instead of having to wait for all of our batch processes to run. So that's been a really useful tool for us to roll out. All of this brings us to pretty much where we are today as a team. We've seen a large spike of teams following our preferred secure pattern, 29% increase for tens of thousands of GitHub repos and thousands of our engineers working on this is a lot of work. We obviously have more to go to reach 100% completion in this space. We don't know what 2025 will look like for this. We're hoping it's a one-time activity, but again, we'll have to wait, hear feedback, and see what potential changes for next year look like. Now, as that brings us to what we're working on today, Susan and I will go through some of our key objectives that we're really excited about through the rest of this year. Now we've done all of the right steps or many of the right steps, and we've seen really, really good results in the past two years. But because developers are humans, <laughs> at least for now. <laughs> and, and humans make mistakes, right? The developers of our open source libraries are inevitably going to continue to introduce new vulnerabilities. And there will continue to be a never ending cycle of vulnerabilities and never ending pile of vulnerabilities to have to manage for our teams. And this isn't just for SCA vulnerabilities. This is across all types of vulnerabilities, endpoint phones, compliance, pen tests, you name it. This really led us to ask ourselves, how can we help our teams even more? How can we help our developers even more? Our team and a couple of folks across, across the security organization came together to form the MEP objectives, which stands for meaningful data, asset differentiation, and prevention. The goal for meaningful data is sort of self-explanatory here. We want to provide the most meaningful data uh, to our teams to help them focus on what is really important. Now for SCA, this could mean only presenting vulnerabilities that are exploitable. If you remember my concern from earlier, I don't want to have to remediate vulnerabilities where my library is not actually being used in a vulnerable way. Well, this will be addressed by reachability independencies, the ability to automatically detect whether your application is using the vulnerable part of a library or not, and only presenting the vulnerabilities where your application is actually uh, using that library in a vulnerable way and that it's actually an exploitable vulnerability. And this again will reduce the overall number of vulnerabilities you have to look at and really help you focus on the more important vulnerabilities, which are those that are exploitable. And then for asset differentiation, the thought is our business critical guest facing systems are more important for people to focus on than the proof of concept GitHub repo that Susan made a few years ago that isn't deployed anywhere in our environment. However, to do this, you need to have a pretty robust source of truth of all of the information from a GitHub repo to its deployed asset and underlying infrastructure. We at Target aren't quite there yet, but we're working with a couple working groups to try to piece what we can together with the ideal goal of helping change severity, potentially pull things in or out of what we display in Pi scores to make sure what teams are focusing on is really the most important piece for them. For prevention, there's two things we're really interested in. One is continuing to implement guardrails for known malicious open source libraries, similar to what we did for the log4j vulnerable version. 
The other piece of it is what Susan will go into a little bit more depth on shortly, but we still have too much work to do. How can we continue to lean into automation of management of our open source dependencies and reduce what is trivial to update and instead have people, when they do have to do something manual, focus on the most important critical or breaking changes. Now for the last wish that we throw into the well today is that by this time next year, Target has a lot of repos or a good chunk of Target repos are configured for auto merging of SEA fixes and dependencies. The idea here is that if your application has really good testing and test coverage, that you should be able to automatically upgrade your dependencies for minor and patch versions without breaking the functionality of your application and automatically keep your dependencies up to date. And the more up to date your dependencies are, the easier and the faster it will be for you to upgrade to the latest version in case something like Log4j happens again. Now, this will take a lot of effort up front to first improve all of your testing across your repos, as well as learn how to configure your, your repo for auto merging. But ideally, once all of that work is done, it should free up a ton of time that you were spending manually um, managing those vulnerabilities and dependencies yourself. There are some concerns with this, as you can imagine. Uh, as a developer, I'm scared that even though I have the best testing and test coverage in place that... For some of these dependencies, it can't be automatically upgraded without causing any uh, any breaking changes. So this is why we're working with our SEA tool to make sure that we're recommending high confidence versions as well as working with partnering with our security ninjas and our, and our engineers across the organization to really smooth out those kinks and um, make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible. We're also providing, providing lots of guidance and deep dives in this space since it's a fairly involved process and fully scaling up our own team members as well to be able to fully support other teams as they go through this process. We're, of course, going to be providing visibility through metrics and community engagement. But since this is such a new process, we're not quite sure what the success metrics will look like yet, just because maybe for like legacy applications, we may not see any benefit. But the, consistent, the consensus continues to be that there are just too many things to have to manually manage. It just doesn't scale to have to manually manage all of your vulnerabilities in all of the repos that you may own all of the time. Automation is the way to go. So Susan and I wrap up our presentation today. We've got three key takeaways that we would think is most important for you to leave here with. For the first takeaway here, we've only been able to get to where we are because we are seeking and sharing user feedback. We're partnering with our engineering teams and we're seeing them more engaged than ever. Sometimes even a little bit more engaged than we would like, but we love it. And we've been really able to see uh, really good security outcomes from this approach. For the second takeaway, I just mentioned the importance of automation. There's just too much to have to manually manage, whether that be in security or business. And putting that work up front to automate will really make your organization move much faster. And the last piece for thoughtfully prioritizing is really around how can you curate data for your teams. Carly drops a single before she has an album to get her fans excited. We all generally probably listen to music that's curated for us, whether it's a radio station, a playlist. I'm guessing most of you don't go out and listen to every single new album that comes out because we don't have the time or interest in all the cases. This is the same thing with all of the security that we need to do in our day to day. How can you think about curating and prioritizing information for your engineering teams so that will be useful for not only them, but also for your team trying to drive change and implement security across your organization? That is all that Susan and I have for our presentation today. We hope that as you leave and you think about open source security, you've got a catchy song that's stuck in your head. I know we will for a long time. Uh, we will now take a quick peek at the Q&A questions that are coming in and answer a few. All right, Susan, the first question is, could you elaborate a little bit more on the SCA exemption process and ask the team to document the risk so at the end of the day, they own it. I, 
you want to take a start at that one? Sure, sure. This process, so it's not like an, a single exemption for a single team. It's this process is typically for um, if this is a vulnerability that is widespread that we're seeing across all our entire environment, we would exempt it for everyone, right? Um, and these are only vulnerabilities that we've done ample analysis with to to figure out that it actually is not a threat in our environment um, and that's actually not exploitable. And maybe for the few handful of folks that we do find where it is exploitable, we keep tra- we keep tags on them and we make sure that they actually go ahead and they remediate that vulnerability. But for the rest of the organization, since it's not exploitable, we would exempt that for them. And that's how we keep track of that. It's also like um, a working group that we have that would work through this process too. It's not just that somebody comes up and they're like, hey, you should exempt this. And we just go ahead and do it. We, of course, it's it's all very calculated, all very thoughtful. And um, yeah, you have anything to add there, Katie? Yeah, I'd say like that working group is made up of a couple of folks from our team, our highest level security ninjas, and then some of our cyber defense partners. And so like Susan mentioned, it's not just randomly saying this is, doesn't apply to our environment. We actually do the in-depth analysis so we feel comfortable that we're taking on that risk within Target. And we have our defense and other partners along the ride for it. All right, the next question is, uh, Susan asking about the product intelligence solution. Is it homegrown? Do we make it? What tool do we use for the pie score? Okay, you want me to take that one again? Yeah. Right. So yes, the product intelligence score is fully homegrown. Um, it's a it's an application that our team owns. We ingest sources from uh, other security teams, and it's a way for us to really aggregate all of the security um, information to. Um, to make it really clear for developers, what are the security action items they need to take in a prioritized manner? And uh, let's see, what else to add here? I'd say um, if, so our boss, Jennifer Shapleski has talked about the Pi score, how we've made it over um, the last seven years lessons learned in depth that like RSA and has recorded talk there. I think you can Google her name um, and get some more information that is publicly available. All right, I'm taking a peek at other, oh, I think I just scheduled something that I didn't answer. Um, one of the questions is what kind of experience will help me stand out for a product security role? I have a software development experience, but new to security. So maybe I'll I'll start Susan and then you can help backfill anything additional. So from a manager perspective, Um, When we benchmark with other organizations that do product security in their space, what makes Target somewhat different is that, like Susan mentioned, most of our team is made up of engineers. Um, When I've recruited or backfilled for roles on the team, we're looking for strong engineers who care about building good applications. The interest in security is kind of a benefit, but not a requirement. Uh, Not all product security teams are like that. Some of them are really just managing and maintaining vendor tools and rolling those out and do less engineering. So I think it depends on if you're able to find what kind of team in product security or application security that could be and how to best align what your background is and what they're looking for. Um, When I've looked out for other companies that are like much smaller that are starting to roll out application security teams, they're looking for someone that does have engineering experience because it's kind of a role that plays many hats. And so um, it might be helpful looking at specific areas like that. Susan, anything else you'd add on? Yeah, I I thought I knew which question you were answering, but then I think based on your answer, I'm not sure anymore. (laughs) You remember? What uh, yes, it would be like, how can you, what what kind of experience will help me stand out for a product security role? I have software uh-huh. development experience, but new to security. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly saying, you know, security roles are so unique in that um, people come from all types of backgrounds. And as long as you have the security inclination to learn um, about security, um, 
that's a great asset to have. But, you know, as Katie mentioned and what I said multiple times, we we really <laughs> we're made up of developers like we build engineering solutions to help other teams build their code more securely. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if I, it really just it's like, do you have the um, the drive to want to learn security things? But um it's it's also we we want really strong engineers on the team as well to be able to build those solutions, those custom solutions that we had to in order to um, uh, drive a lot of the things that we talked about in this talk. All right, wanna, there's a few more questions asking about what tools we use for SCA. That's not something that we can publicly disclose, but there's a lot of vendors, if you just Google software composition analysis out there with some detailed information of what could be best for your enterprise organization, uh, ranging from like new startups to people or companies that have been in the industry for a while. The space moves pretty fast. Um, so like a lot of new things are coming out, which is kind of exciting about being in this area um trying to see what's next all right okay susan one of the questions is how do you validate vulnerabilities that you advise to validate vulnerabilities out or like applicability outside of advisory so like how do, how does it apply to the environment how do we validate potentially that they're fixed. Oh, okay. So we provide at Target with our SCA scanning tool, we provide a um, a local CLI um, that teams can download. And then once they fix the vulnerability, they will initiate the CLI scan, which will do a local scan on your repo to make sure that the vulnerability no longer pops up. So that's how you can validate that you remediated that vulnerability. You can also, based on the package manager you're using too, there's tools that you can use to um, look at the dependency trees of your application and make sure that the vulnerability is, uh, it, the vulnerable version of the library is no longer there as well. And so those are just a few ways that you can um, validate. Or for us, we can, you, can you can remediate, push it all the way up and then wait for all our batch processes to run and such and see that it's been reflected as well. And that's another way to validate. All right. Uh, one of the other questions, Susan, I'm wondering if you can take is, what is a, a, the best way to gather feedback from development teams outside of using security ninjas? Oh, um, we have a very active Slack, Slack support channel. Uh, for all of our product security tools. And um, that's a way that we encourage teams to uh, provide feedback. We recently just uh, launched our community channel too to encourage like teams to share um, some of the exploration they've, they're doing in the space as well. And that's another area where we, we hope that teams are going to be providing feedback for us. Um, we also periodically uh, go out and perform those um, user interviews and those and send out surveys. And those are other ways that we've done previously where we've gathered feedback as well. Yeah. Um, OK, one of the additional questions that I'll take, Susan, and then you can add on if there's anything additional. I'm going to merge two questions together, which is how do you hold uh, teams like sysadmins to be accountable to fixing things along with separate teams managing open source vulnerabilities versus pen test and other endpoint vulns and managing remediation? So the answer to both of those is really one, we do have multiple teams. We are, we are incredibly large enterprise. And so we've got security teams that run our endpoint vulnerability management program at Target. We have our team that's doing application security. Um, and then we also have a penetration testing team. So the output of all of that data gets funneled into our security Pi score and it's all aggregated and tied to an application for teams. So the end teams that would include sysadmins, for example, that report up to their team reporting structure, they have the applications that map to them, are then able to go into their pie score and see, here are all of my vulnerabilities for everything consolidated, what's potentially overdue that I need to take action on, what needs patching. So everything that they are managing and need to maintain 
all is available within that pi score view for them to fix. So it doesn't matter if there are multiple different teams that manage these programs, we can still take out all of their data and feed it into their pi score. Susan, anything you'd add? Yeah, I think you touched on the important parts. We, you know, our pi score is rolled up at a product level and um, Sometimes at the product level, it's a single team. Sometimes it's multiple teams under it. And so we rely on the team to really uh, go in and take, uh, you know, responsibility for the and, and break out whichever action items that are um, specific to their teams themselves in, the, in that manner. But because it's tied at a product level, um, we hope that that really helps team know which action items are tied to, to their team specifically. All right. Uh, one of the questions is, do we have career opportunities for students? I know that we've got an engineering, target engineering intern program that includes interns being hosted in our cybersecurity space. Um, so I, I don't have the details of how to get access to that, but I think that gets posted within our jobs and career site at Target when they go to hire for summer interns. Right, then Susan, the next question is, what if a patch isn't available yet? Ooh, um, that's a tough one. Um, we, first of all, what I'd like to say is like for some of the items, if it's for any reason, your team can't remediate a certain vulnerability, um, and this, this is for like valid reasons. Like maybe, um, there are things that are blocking you from doing the, um, the security action that needs to be done, um, for the Pi score specifically, we, as long as you have that story to tell, it's okay to wait and balance the, the business priorities and the, the feasibility of when to remediate items and when to take care of security items and balance that with what you actually have to do work-wise. Um, so if a patch isn't available yet, then you may, you have, we empower our teams to make the decision whether it's okay for them to uh, either move, move forward and risk accept that pretty much, or, um, or if they want to remediate it, you can, um, you can look at libraries other libraries um, that don't have vulnerabilities instead of using the ones that doesn't have an unpatched version or yeah, that doesn't have a patch version. Um, you can exclude the specific, if it's if it's a library that's pulling in a transitive dependency or like a, yeah, if it's a library that's pulling in another library where that library is um, vulnerable, you can exclude that as well. I'm really trying to remember what are the other recommendations? Katie, do you remember? I think there's a lot. No, <laughs> you covered most of them. Yeah, th there, there's a lot, but ideally we just want teams to be able to, we, we want to empower teams to be able to make that decision themselves to remediate phones versus not based on feasibility and based on if it's possible or not. Mm -hmm. All right, the last question is, any tips for building automated SCA in-house for smaller teams? I'll start with this. I think really it's about how can you make SCA integrated as best as possible with how your engineers are working in their day-to-day. -day. There's a lot of tools and a lot of options out there, some that are open source, some that cost a lot of money. And so it's really thinking about how can you scale this for your whole team and what will engineers actually use and find useful. So doing proof of concepts and getting your engineers involved with evaluating tools is a great way to identify what could be a best fit for your space because there's so many options that you could go with. Susan, anything else you'd add there? Yeah, I, I would say there are um, some open source tools out there and I would I would encourage exploring those first before building it yourself. Um, because it's very complicated based on, based on the different package managers, the different languages, um, you're going to need to really fully be able to do analysis on the different types of, um, dependency trees. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's a little, it's complicated. So <laughs> I would encourage using tools that already exist. Um, that's, that's a reason why we haven't also built our own in-house tool, just because it's, uh, it's very complicated. <laughs> Yes. Um, all right. That's 
all that we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining our talk. Susan and I really appreciated it. Hope you all have a great rest of your day.